You should tell me about Alpha. Oh, Alpha. I don't have it written down. You should tell me. Right now? Yeah. Well, I was in college. And next door to us, Mark and I, and it was an African-American guy named Freddie. We kind of got to be friends with him. Mm -hmm. And they had, in, in the dorm, in the girls' dorm, they had this a real big, obese, black lady, co-ed named Alva. And she was supposedly the head of a gang, which is almost unheard of for a woman, you know. But she was really tough, and uh, she fell in love with Freddie. Freddie was a little about my size, and, uh, so, and we, we, he was telling stuff. And he goes, "I want y'all to come down and be, come in the lounge, and I'm gonna be sitting there. There's two couches back to back. You guys sit there. Like, like you're talking, I'll sit there." And then Alec came in, so we were, they were just a few feet away from us. We were pretending we were talking. And she goes, "Freddie, I love you." He goes, "But Alec, I don't love you." She goes, "Freddie, look, look at it out the window there." Bill Booker, Bill Booker, Bear Hooker, and Dickie Brown standing up there. Say you better like me. You better love me. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to come over here and like her. Let me look at you in a different light. I don't see what they're talking about. <laughs> That's funny. After a few seconds, he lost interest, got down, and walked off. I lost no time in getting out of there. Still, I thought he was tame, or so his trainer said. Next day, I went back, praying with a pre friend of mine. When he, we got around the corner, I saw a very different sight. The tiger was snarling, clawing at the, at the bars. No. Po poised to pounce. His trainer looked stunned. I've never seen him like this. He stuttered, never. Now, I thought this guy probably had been with the tiger since it was a cub. It, 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 at least the cat's whole life as an adult, but I wouldn't sure. So hey, I'd Winston, go. stop. What's he doing? These are there. my brand new shoes. Stop, hey, get off, get off. I said get off it. He didn't intimidate very easily. No. I don't think he just understands love. <laughs> it said mainly my own stupidity. I had gone into a very dangerous situation without any knowledge of what might happen. The cat turned out not to be very tame at all. I never went in again. However, I'd go see him from time to time. Last time I saw him, he was lying on the ground looking up at me eating something. I could hear the snapping of whatever was in his powerful jaws. That's one of the house cats, Robert told me. He got too close to the cage. Ah. I've done some stupid things in my life, but this has to be the stupidest. This is called Johnny. One of the more exciting events in my life for me was for me was the league's basketball tournament. It was always held on a Saturday after the regular season. I would usually drive the minibus myself, along with my 12 or so players. That way I got paid for coaching and driving the bus. The only good thing about having a bad team is you get to go home early. Conversely, if you, your team is good it, and played well in the tournament, you might not be back before dark. In this particular day, we did quite well. To be honest, I don't know if we won that particular tournament or not, but it was dark before I got the last player home. The player's home was, was a ways off in the desert, but near was, to, was a family that I had gotten close to. I decided to drop by and wait for and visit with it for a, a bit. I pulled the bus and around to the back of their home and knocked on the, on the door. I wasn't prepared for what I saw. Several men were standing in the living room with holding rifles. I recognized all of them as other ranchers from this area. Their faces were grim. What's going on, I asked. Long story, Leon replied. That was his, it was his ranch. Uh, bottom line, he said, Johnny Johnson and his brother claim we owe him money and they're coming out to get it. Johnny Johnson was a shady character who owned a little rundown bar on a little road far from anything else. Rumor was that he'd been in prison for murder. At any rate, he was someone to be feared. If he came, we, he would be, and if he came, he would be armed. So Leon and some of the neighboring ranchers had banded together. And here I walked in, still wearing my Cougar basketball jersey. Can I help? I heard myself saying, 
help, I thought to myself. I think that I, I think I fired a 22 pistol once at a can and missed. Yeah. And even as I said, you know, I knew I should be back on that school bus leaving a cloud of dust in my wake. Yeah, you can help us. Watch the back door. And one of, those men, one of the men said, as he handed me a pistol and a shotgun. Great, I thought. I'm standing in a double wide trailer, staring into the black night with two guns that I'm not even sure I know how to work. On top of that, I'm responsible for that bus. How can I get out of this? This family had been good to me, taking care of me during a bout with pneumonia. I couldn't leave them just because of that bus. I probably should leave because I probably should leave because of the bus. I, I, um, to him, you know. He said, "We really don't need you." Great, I exclaimed, but he hadn't finished. We don't need you here. We need someone at Fred's house. That's where all the children and women are. And he didn't put down. He, but he didn't put any men down there. Fred's house was about half a mile down the road, actually closer to Johnson's bar. They passed that first, so I would go up. So I went up in Fred's living room, staring out the window, watching the road all night long. Around two thirty in the morning, I saw headlights. I called to the Leon. I called to Leon's warning him and steadied myself. The car got close, went by, turned right before it got to the Leon's ranch. Turned out to be two Mormon kids coming back from a dance. They never knew how many guns were trained on them that night. Anyway, the night passed and no one showed up and I went home. No real message or moral there, just in that adventure. Carrie, we were very fortunate at Dayland for a bunch of a bunch of reasons. One was that we all had a full-time aide to assist. Mine was so competent, it was like she, we were team teaching. She was smart, organized, and energetic, sort of the kind con, contrasted with me. Anyway, I, I had no yeah. problem leaving her alone with the class if I needed to leave for a short period. On March 17, 1975, I had to leave for what turned out to be a rather long period. Mr. Lawson, the intercom said, you you are needed at the cafeteria, run. Run? I never heard that on the intercom before. I knew it had to be important, so I ran. Entering the cafeteria, I saw a group of people slowly standing in a circle, watching two men on the ground with someone laying between them. I saw, I recognized the eighth grade teacher and the local local head patrolman. They were performing CPR on a student. It was an eighth grade boy, Kerry Adams. They were, they were quite exhausted and wanted me to help. I'd never given CPR before, but I knelt down. There was some plastic cover on Kerry's mouth. I took a breath, deep breath and breathed into it. Nothing happened. Harder, Bob yelled harder. I felt a sense of violation and I almost urged to apologize to Kerry, but I, as I blew as hard as I could. His chest rate came up and then fell back. I continued with him and within minutes I was exhausted. Bob took over and for the next half hour or so the three of us worked on Kerry. The intercom kept telling the people, the other teachers not to bring their students to the cafeteria. The nearest hospital was in Yuma, 80 some miles away. The helicopter had been dispatched the whole time we got no, res no response from Kerry. Soon we heard the pop 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 of the helicopter's blades and paramedics burst in. Continuing the CPR, they were quickly out the door and only chapter and gone. We were spent both physically and emotionally. The kids were sent home and all the faculty went to the office to wait. The phone didn't ring. Finally, I called Kerry's uncle. He confirmed what was suspected. Kerry hadn't survived. He had, a heart, it had been a heart attack. He was 13 years old. I hadn't taught him, but I coached him. He was a quiet kid, never in any trouble. He said his heart attack killed him almost instantly. That there was nothing I could have done. But I felt guilty, guilty because I didn't know what I was doing. Guilty because I taught children and I knew nothing about rudimentary first aid, let alone life-saving techniques such as CPR. That summer I took an extensive first aid course and I practiced CPR on a dummy called Rosessa Annie. The next year, I actually used the Heimlich maneuver on a boy, Ernie, boy from what I, and say, I used it on this boy, I'm a Heimlich maneuver in the cafeteria. The boy, Ernie, was choking and I used what I had learned. He was out okay in seconds and very few people ever knew it happened. So no, I hadn't been able to save Carrie, but he, he helped me. He helped me save Ernie. I did that 
once, people here too. Oh yeah. Dina, she was choking, and I gave her CPR, and she she'll tell you if you ask her, she'll say yes. He saved my life. A math project, starfish. Bosses. It goes on and on and on and on. And on. Yeah. Must once not. Jim, once inside. <laughs> Winston wants attention. No, I mean, uh, he, he's not whining. He just.